Hello everybody, how are you today? Today we have an amazing guest and probably most, most of you know about her. She's food science babe, um, her name is Erin and we're going to have her live today. We're going to go through quite a few different questions about conventional versus organic, things as well, things about GMOs as well and how she's run her business and how she's grown as well. So I think a lot of you has asked me as well about that. So I've got her here. Um, during that time when I worked at that company, I actually was, you know, more of an organic food consumer. I, I believed at that time that organic was better and, um, that's just sort of what I bought because I thought it was healthier and I didn't really question it. Um, and so I actually left that company and actually went to work for a more natural and organic company um, because that's sort of what I believed in at the time. And in interestingly enough, when I worked at that company, I sort of started realizing kind of how arbitrary the organic and non-GMO and all those kind of labels were because um, it was a really small company. And so I was the only food scientist there. And so my role was to get their products non-GMO verified and organic certified. And so okay. just realizing kind of how it was just a lot of paperwork and it really, you know, the decisions were being made by marketing people and um, it didn't have anything to do with the fact that those labels made the product any healthier or any safer or anything like that. So that's kind of when I started questioning it. And then I still, like, I still, still believed it was, you know, healthier. I was like, I can, I can afford it. I'm still going to buy it. It really wasn't until I had my daughter four years ago that I was just really getting fed up with all of the marketing that was really marketed towards moms of young children and, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to actually start looking into the actual research on this versus just, you know, thinking it's healthier and just buying it. Um, you know, obviously when you're, when you're um, feeding a child, it's, it's a lot more expensive. So I was just interested to see if I did need to be spending more money. And so that's kind of how I got my page going and everything, you know, when I started actually looking at the research and realizing how a lot of these things were the opposite of what I used to believe and um, just sort of getting fed up with a lot of the pages that I was seeing on social media, you know, like food babe and all those pages, um, just making, you know, specifically parents of young children afraid of what they were feeding their children and um, just a lot of the misinformation, you know, I had obviously worked in the food industry for quite a while at that point and just a lot of the you know the misinformation that they spread about the food industry as well um so yeah I was just like hey I'm gonna start a page and I had no idea if anyone was going to be interested <laughs> or anything so that's kind of how I got started that's amazing and you've done a pretty amazing job in actually taking the facts put in a very very simple way that people can understand oh this, this actually wasn't as, as, as complicated or as bad as I thought. And you've been able to open their eyes to a lot of moms, a lot, a lot of people that were so scared of having a just conventional foods versus uh, having to buy all the time organic. Otherwise, it would be a, something that they would contaminate their body or they had toxins or pesticides and things like that. And I guess you've done a great job in that area where – you jump in and say, look, it is fine, it is okay, it is no such big difference and it's not superiority on that. So what is actually food science when we think about the term uh, that you actually work in that role, what food science is? For a lot of people that might not know what it is. It's, it's a lot more, <laughs> like when people see food, you know, on the store shelves, we don't really... Um, realize how much is behind that product ending up on the shelf. And so, 
you know, there are so many different things that you can go into with food science. I mean, obviously you can either go into industry or you can stay more on the research side. You know, um, I talked to a PhD ice cream scientist earlier um, a, a couple months ago. And so, I mean, you can get really into just one, you know, like you can't believe how complex, you know, something like ice cream is. <laughs> we eat it and we enjoy it, but so many of these things just, you know, all of the, all of the chemical compounds that these foods are made up of, um, you know, and then when you're formulating something, you have to understand like how the different ingredients react with each other. Um, one of the biggest things with creating products for, you know, store shelves is making sure that they stay safe while they're on the shelf and they're not growing mold, you know, they're not going bad while they're on the shelf. So, I mean, one of the biggest things is just understanding like how to preserve foods if they're shelf stable or, you know, even if they're in the refrigerator, making sure, um, making sure they're safe by the time that a consumer gets it. And then, um, I mean, everything from not only developing the product, but then, you know, I've been involved in, in sensory testing, you know, where we have panels taste different things if we're trying to match something or if we're trying to, um, you know, make, there's a lot of different sensory testing that goes on behind the scenes before you even get it to a store shelf. Um, and so, I mean, you can, in larger companies, you can spend like, you know, an entire year developing a product before it even ends up on the shelf. And like a lot of times it doesn't even end up on the shelf because um, you know, we do testing and it or, or it just doesn't work out like pricing wise. I mean, there's so many things that you have to take into account when you're developing a product, you know, it's like, it has to, it has to, um, you know, stay safe. It has to stay preserved. It has to taste good. It has to, you know, a lot of times you're also, um, as a food scientist, making sure that you're getting all the pricing information when you're getting ingredients in to make sure you're, if you have a specific price point you need to, you need to reach and stuff like that. So there's so much, it's, it's just crazy. Like how much goes on behind the scenes. Like when you go to the grocery store and you see all these, these, um, you know, products on the shelf, you don't realize how much is really behind that just in terms of making sure that it's safe, making sure also that, you know, all the information on the package is correct. Um, I do a lot of, now that I work from home a lot more because I take care of my daughter, I do a lot of, um, you know, formulate, formulating, but then also I help companies um, get their nutrition facts panels figured out for their label, for their packaging. So just all of the regulatory requirements that goes on um, from everything that has to be correct on the package and all that kind of stuff. So there's quite a bit you know that you can go you can go into as a food scientist and then um you know it is one of those things where you can just be doing different things all the time so if you enjoy not doing the same thing every day it's a great field to go into because i mean you're literally doing something different every day so yeah yes i i had perhaps one or two subjects on food science and we actually were to in a lab and doing different exercise with different recipes and maybe just exchanging one item or one ingredient to another to see what happened uh, with the, with yeah. the texture, the flavor, um, everything that, that just changed by exchanging one ingredient from another. So I would, I would, yeah. I would ask you, um, I have two follow up questions from what you said. One was, um, what is all about about this bliss point that people talk a lot about that when you find the perfect combination of salt, fat, and sugar, it makes it the right and perfect point, Swiss point, for you to get addicted or like get in love with something that is so highly palatable that you want to keep eating it. So tell me a little bit about that. You probably have been in, involved in that a little bit. Actually, no. Okay. What's really interesting is somebody like mentioned that on my page, I would say like probably less than a year ago. And I was like, what are you talking about? I've never okay. heard of this bliss point. No, I honestly like that's not, I mean, like we, we obviously do sensory testing and things like that to make sure like, 
people like it. And um, I mean, honestly, a lot of the projects that I've been involved in in companies are, you know, the past 10 years really has been a lot about reducing sugar, making things healthier. So, so many of my projects have been like trying to reduce sugar or, I mean, a lot of things that I, you know, I, I haven't worked on, um, maybe they do do that at some companies, but no, I had never even heard of that before somebody mentioned it on my page. And, but honestly, it just sounds like what you would do if you're cooking a meal at home or, you know, like, I just think it's so interesting how people will say that, you know, about like food scientists making food delicious and addictive. Mm. And I mean, essentially chefs at restaurants are, are trying to make delicious food that people want to eat. So, I mean, it's not like there's any secret formula that we make sure all of our products, you know, abide by so that consumers will become addicted or anything like that. I mean, yes, we want it to taste good. Yes, we want consumers to keep buying it, obviously. Otherwise, it wouldn't stay on the shelf for very long. So um, I don't, yeah, I think a lot of times people think there's some like, you know, we're like secretly have this formula that only we know and we know exactly how to make people <laughs> addicted to it. And it's just kind of funny because I actually had never even heard of that until somebody mentioned it on my page. And I was like, what the heck, this is a thing. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. That that's, that's great. It is good that you, you are very open about it. And the, obviously I don't think there is a, a huge magic on it, but I always have, uh, read a little bit about that and I wanted to hear your thoughts because it seems to be a thing when it comes to finding the the right and the perfect Swiss point that is is just going to be like the hook for you to get um, or addicted or just in love with something that is not necessarily something that you would have normally but usually this is like highly processed highly palatable foods like going uh, for a hamburger in McDonald's why is it so delicious that you want to keep eating it um, or things like a, a specific ice cream or a chocolate bar or something that probably is uh, being developed for that reason to make it really tasty and obviously with the competition in the market you want to your product to excel to be different to be amazing and I guess that's where probably this sort of bliss point can come into place um, I guess it's just an, a marketing strategy as well to make it really really palatable yeah, I mean, I think obviously, like you want your product to succeed in the market, so you want it to taste good. But yeah, I don't think there's anything different than, like I said, a chef at a restaurant making sure their food is really good and people want to keep coming back and eating it. So um, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, obviously, if something, you know, does have a lot of salt, a lot of fat, you know, typically, you know, sweet, those are the types of things that we prefer. So um so yeah, obviously those things are going to taste good, but um, you know, the notion that there's some like magical formula or something that we're doing something different than, you know, a chef would be doing in a restaurant or even, you know, when you try to cook at home, I'm, I'm assuming most people are trying to make their food taste good. So um, yeah, it's not really like, you know, you want your product to succeed in the market, but again, it's not like there's this like, see there it's not like there's these secret ingredients that we're putting into things that you know I think there's a lot of a lot of misinformation around people thinking we're like hiding these secret ingredients and things or something that um people don't know about but it's really it's you know everything has to be labeled everything has to be put on the label we're not hiding ingredients or putting in secret addictive ingredients in, in foods um so yeah <laughs> I had another follow-up question and what you mentioned a little bit about the processed foods and how you have to make sure you have the right preservative to make sure they have the shelf life and they know they safe mm -hmm. and all of that things and a lot of people come yeah. to probably you, you've, you've got a lot of backlash on this uh, on the sense that well any product that you can read the labels and has more than one ingredient is going to be dangerous for you. It's, it's not going to be good for your health. What would you say about processed foods? Is there any 
Anything that you think that could be something that you need to look for that is potentially dangerous for your health, like preservative, colorants, uh, additives, things like that, that you think can be represent a harm? Because a lot of people have the fear that if any preservative or any additive are in there, that's going to be a, a product that's going to, perhaps in the long term, it's going to affect your health or your immune system or anything like that. Yeah, so I mean, all these chemical compounds that are, you know, they have to be looked at as just that, you know, chemical compounds, everything, whether you, you know, whether you can pronounce it, or whether you can't pronounce it, it doesn't mean that just because you can pronounce it, um, that somehow it's more safe than something you can't pronounce. So all those sort of food mantras that go around just are really they're just nonsense. I mean, obviously, it doesn't make any sense that if you can't pronounce it, that all of a sudden it's unsafe. So yes, you will see a lot of ingredients, uh, particularly a lot of the preser preservatives that will be on the label that you might not be familiar with, you might not be able to pronounce them. But I think it's especially just kind of crazy that preservatives are the ones that get demonized because literally preservatives are making the food safe, like they're making the food safe, safe safer for longer. Um, if those weren't being put in there, you know, it, it, it would be causing foodborne illnesses. Um, and so these things are really making food safer and they are at safe amounts. So the amounts that you typically have to put, you know, a lot of these different ingredients that you kind of see at the end of the label, um, they're, at, they're in there at safe amounts. They're in there at very, very low amounts. Typically, they are ingredients that help to control for things like moisture or pH. So those are the two biggest things that you try to control for when you're trying to make sure something, um, you know, can't, microbes won't grow on it. You have to control for moisture and pH. Those are like the two biggest things. And so, um, yeah, these preservatives, like just because you can't necessarily pronounce them or it's not something that you can necessarily buy from the grocery store or put in your food, um, it doesn't mean that it's unsafe. And I know a lot of people have asked me, like, is there one ingredient that you would tell people to avoid? And I mean, there isn't really. Everything that, you know, is, is being put in products, they are being put in there at safe levels. A lot of times, um, you know, a lot of times, like the accounts like Food Babe and the people that try to fear monger over single ingredients, you know, they're using rodent studies, they're, they're using safety studies, essentially, which are, which are helpful to figure out what levels are safe. Um, but they're using those studies to scare people into thinking that these ingredients are unsafe when it's like, they're being put in the products at so much lower levels than these studies that they're citing. And um, so there's not even really one ingredient that I would tell people to stay away from. I mean, I think your overall health is going to have to do a lot more with, you know, your overall diet and lifestyle Absolutely. than it is just one specific ingredient or, um, you know, one preservative or, you know, making sure that, you know, one of the other food mantras that's out there is making, you know, like, oh, if it's over five ingredients, it's bad for you, which just doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter how many ingredients are in there. That doesn't mean that it's all of a sudden unsafe. One of my favorite graphics is, um, it says all natural banana, and then it has a list oh, of yes. all of the compounds that makes up a banana. And I don't think people realize that um, just like the most basic level, it's like literally everything we eat is made up of chemicals. And all of these chemicals have overlapping toxicities with these synthetic, you know, whether they're preservatives or additives, um, you know, the natural chemicals that are in foods have overlapping toxicities with these things that we're putting in there. And so it doesn't just automatically mean that it's unsafe because we're, we're putting these things in there. And, um, you know, every chemical has to be assessed on the safety of itself. And, um, you know, like, yeah, I guess I wouldn't say there is one ingredient I would avoid or tell people to avoid. Um, like I said, I think it has to do more with an overall diet than it has to do with making sure, sure you're avoiding single ingredients or, you know, I think that can be 
detrimental as well. I don't think people stress en enough about the anxiety that comes along with trying to make sure that you're um, not eating certain ingredients or, you know, all those kind of things. I don't think people stress that enough, how, how, how much anxiety can be created around being afraid of your food when you don't, when we have such a safe food supply, like you don't need to be afraid of the food on, on you know, the shelf in the grocery store. So. Yes, I, yes, I completely agree. And I would say like we have everything, everything can just kill you if you ate it in a, in an amount that is completely, uh, or a wretched, right. like if you ate or drank, drank water. And if you had water in excessive amounts, that can kill you as well. Right. In the, it, it has toxic levels if you had, like, even vitamin D. You can't have just vitamin D right. on a daily basis just because uh, it is good for you or because it's a vitamin. Every single, every single thing, even if it's natural, can reach points of toxicity in your body if you're having it uh, crazily. Uh, so we demonize right. things that are chemicals. Uh, but things, everything is a chemical, to be honest. And you, you talk a lot about that. Everything we, we eat has, uh, if you actually, the, the, the labels actually were in vegetables, you could read as well all of the different chemicals and different ingredients that are natural and composing the, what the, the vegetable is. So I think you, you got a lot, something to say about that specifically. About the like synthetic versus natural that like it, the chemicals that you see even in vegetables or fruit yeah yeah so i've posted this study quite a bit but it shows um there's you know obviously there's tons of hundreds of different compounds in every single you know fruit and vegetable and if you would take those chemical compounds and use them you know like how they conduct safety studies with the additives that we put into foods and people fear monger over them and say, well, they can cause cancer at these super, super, super high levels. Well, a lot of natural fruits and vegetables contain chemical compounds that could cause cancer at really high levels as well. We know that they aren't because we're not consuming them at those levels. So the same goes for the, these ingredients that we are adding into foods, just because they can be toxic, like you said, at a, at a high dose. Um, that doesn't mean that these really, really small doses that we're putting into foods at safe levels, um, they're not harmful at the amounts that we're consuming them in. So a lot of people's arguments when it comes to this sort of fall back onto the appeal to nature fallacy. And, um, you know, just because something is natural, that doesn't mean that it's safe. There's a lot of natural compounds that are very highly toxic. And so um, just to say that something is safer because it's natural, um, it's just, it's not true because, you know, they're natural compounds and synth synthetic compounds, you know, they, we can't, we don't know anything about a chemical's toxicity just based on the fact that it's natural or synthetic, so. That's just because something is natural doesn't mean like it's going to be safe or you can just have it um, limitless just because it, it is just going right. to have the label of being natural. And I think that's a, a word that is so much uh, overused and overrated uh, when it comes to marketing and putting things into label yeah. that says, oh, this is natural and that therefore it is, uh, it is going to go be good for your health. And right. if it doesn't yeah. have the, that label, then it's not as good. Yeah, so natural has no FDA definition. There's, it's not a regulated term. So when it, like, I would say just ignore that. I mean, yeah, it's purely marketing. It means nothing as far as the safety or the nutrition of the food goes. And then when you get into ingredients, you know, like flavors and colors, a lot of, a lot of marketing on packages now will say things like, um, you know, no artificial flavors or no artificial colors, and they'll have, you know, natural flavors and colors. And, you know, they're all going to be safe. But what's interesting about um, the fact that they're specifically calling out that there's no artificial and there's, there's natural, and for some reason, consumers think that's better. But in reality, a lot of times, like these synthetic colors and flavors and things like that, um, they can they are more efficient and they're more sustainable to be created in a lab versus 
you know, like a natural flavor or a natural color, you're needing quite a bit of plant material to extract, you know, these colors and flavors. And that's a lot of times it's a lot worse for the environment than synthesizing these things in a lab. And a lot of times too, when it comes to the specific compounds that are created, I mean, a natural flavor could be the exact same chemical compound as a synthetic one. And so your body doesn't know the difference if, the, if it's the exact same compound. And so a lot of times, you know, even just artificial versus natural, when it comes to these ingredients, people think natural is better, but a lot of times it's actually worse for the environment and it's not any less safe. Um, in reality, like when it comes to artificial versus natural colors, a lot of times the, you know, the artificial ones have been tested quite a bit more um, for safety. And so we actually know more about these synthetic compounds a lot of times than we do the natural ones. So um, I just think it's interesting how people are more afraid of these ingredients that have been studied a lot more and are actually better for the environment. But for some reason, just because Again, the appeal to nature fallacy, everyone just thinks if it's natural, it, it must be better. Um, but it's just, that's, that's not the case. And, that's, and, that, and that goes the same with like when we look at the labels and it says no GMOs or uh, mm -hmm. is organic and it is being um, processed in a way that has no, no allergens or no chemicals or and this was uh, literally in the food labels and yeah. it can appeal for too much for a lot of people that says oh i should be buying this because it's safer for me or like as a mom mm -hmm. you want to feed your kids with the best things as possible with the best yeah. quality and when you see these labels you are you're more likely to pay more if it's yeah. safer and if it's better quality, but it actually has no difference to uh, just normal right. foods. Yeah, so that's one of the biggest, probably like the biggest misconceptions I would say surrounding organic is that, um, you know, they market it as though it doesn't use pesticides. And so many people think that organic doesn't use pesticides. And, um, you know, the whole, a lot of organic companies use that as their marketing. I mean, um, they will vilify conventional and say like conventional is just covered in pesticides. And um, it's just, it's, it's not true. I mean, first of all, organic can use pesticides. Um, they have to use, they have to use mostly naturally derived pesticides. They can use some synthetic pesticides, but um, again, it's like all these regulations surrounding organic sound good to the consumer because again, natural sounds better. So when you tell people that organic can only use natural pesticides, they're like, oh, well, isn't that a good thing? But it isn't necessarily a good thing because a lot of times, um, you know, the natural pesticides aren't as effective and so they have to be used at a higher rate. Um, you know, once again, just because it's natural, it doesn't mean that it's less toxic or better for the environment. So, you know, these natural pesticides have overlapping toxicities with the synthetic pesticides. And, you know, essentially, they just don't have many, have as many tools in their toolbox to be using. So, whereas conventional farmers have the ability to use a synthetic pesticide that might be more effective, might be less toxic, might be you know, less persistent in the environment, whereas the organic farmer can't use that, they have to use the natural one. And so, you know, these regulations aren't translating into, um, they're not translating into safer foods, they're not translating into more nutritious foods. I mean, we have a lot of studies backing that up, showing that, um, you know, it's organic foods aren't safer, they're not more nutritious. And in reality, organic farming is actually worse for the environment because it takes up to 40% more land. So that's the biggest reason why organic is um, going to be worse for the environment. It takes up more land. Um, they're not able to use GMOs, which do have a lot of environmental benefits. Um, and so again, like so much of this, of this marketing is just so backwards, like to what the consumer believes and it is, it is because it is marketing. And obviously, um, you know, since organic 
does take more land and more resources. It's more expensive. And on top of that, I mean, I've worked at companies where we, where we have gotten our products organic certified and it takes a lot of time to get the paperwork done, to get, you know, all of that, um, all of that paperwork filled out, making sure all of your ingredients are organic certified. And so all of that, you know, ends up getting passed onto the consumer. And obviously consumers aren't going to pay more for something unless there's a reason. So, you know, it's like they've created this marketing behind it where consumers think it's healthier, um, so they will pay more for it. But in reality, I mean, that's just the studies don't show that it's healthier, that it's safer. I mean, the levels of pesticide residues on both conventional and organic are they so the USDA um, tests them as a part of their pesticide data program and all that data you can just you can go on the USDA uh, PDP website and look at all of their results. But I mean, year after year, it shows that the pesticides on both conventional and organic are hundreds to thousands of times below their tolerance levels. So, you know, from a pesticide residue perspective, all of our food is very safe. And so the narrative behind saying, you know, conventional, I think people just think conventional is just covered in pesticides and it's just, that's not the case. And, um, that really just comes from the organic industry trying to create a market for their products, um, trying to get consumers to pay more. And um, also there's a lot of groups that people think are reputable groups like the EWG that sort of perpetuate that misinformation. You know, they're funded by the organic industry. Every year they come out with their dirty dozen list, which isn't evidence-based evidence at all. And they, they scare consumers about conventional. And so um, I think people don't necessarily view organic as, you know, a lot of people say like big egg and big food. And they, they always paint the picture that conventional is like this large business that's just horrible. But at the same time, I mean, organic is a huge industry too. And they use marketing tactics as well to sell their products. And so, um, yeah, it's just uh, so much of this is just marketing. And, you know, it's really unfortunate because, um, you know, I think a lot of people think that when I tell them that, that I'm somehow like vilifying organic or I'm telling people not to buy organic. But if you want to buy, if you have all this information and you still want to buy organic, that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, I know a lot of people that, personally know an organic farmer and they just like supporting them and obviously that's great um you know i think i think the part that can be harmful is when you do have people that are can't afford organic and so they just buy less produce overall or they are just like i said have anxiety over oh my gosh am i poisoning my kids am i poisoning myself and so all of this unnecessary anxiety and um, trying to, to buy organic. And so you just end up buying less because you can't afford it. So these things, you know, they're not, they're, they can be very harmful as well. And I guess the same fear goes for like whether it is frozen or canned versus buying it just uh, out of the, picking it up from, from the shelves and it's natural but if it's frozen or if it's canned, then it because it has preservative or because it's not natural per se, then it's dangerous yeah. for your health. And I think yeah, so that's another yeah, that's another big misconception too. And again, it can be harmful because I mean, I even know myself. I buy a lot of my produce um, frozen just because it will go bad by the time, you know, I, if I buy all of it fresh, I end up throwing so much of it away. And so that can, you know, that misinformation can be harmful too. I mean, buying produce, whichever way you can buy it, you know, if, if I know, you know, a lot of people that live in food deserts, maybe they only have canned available to them. So obviously buying canned or frozen, if you don't have fresh available to you is going to be a lot better than not having anything at all. Mm. And you know, a lot of times frozen is actually going to be, have more nutrients in it because it's being frozen right away. Whereas, you know, if you buy fresh and you wait a few days to eat it, um, you know, 
the frozen could actually be more nutritious. Um, so yeah, and then canned as well. I think just for some reason, people think that it's worse for you. I mean, the only one thing I would say to look out for in canned is um, high sodium, but I know, I know they do have like low sodium brands or even no sodium. And so that's, that's the one thing with can that might be a little bit different. But other than that, I mean, any way that you can get your fruits and vegetables is going to be better than not getting them at all. I agree. So, yes, yeah. I agree. And talking about something you mentioned as well, same with organic and conventional, you, re you mentioned about the GMOs. And I think that's something that you get a lot of backlash as well. And you always... Yeah trying to put it in a, in a way that people can understand uh, that they are demonizing it as if, as if they were a bad thing or they were dangerous. So what is a GMO what, what, and what is your stand on that? Yeah, so GMOs, um, I hate that term because it's not a scientific term, but so GMO literally stands for genetically modified organism. And Essentially, when you see that label on food, so you'll see the non-GMO label on food, and that term GMO is essentially de defined by this organization called the Non-GMO Project, and they have defined GMO as specifically one, one specific crop modification technique. And so um, there are many different crop modification techniques. Um, you know, virtually every single crop that is grown today has been modified in some way, whether it's through, you know, traditional crossbreeding or um, a lot of people don't know about something called mutagenesis, mutagenesis, which has been around since the 1930s, um, that uses either chemicals or radiation to induce mutations in seeds. And, and then those mutations are propagated and they see what comes out of that. And, you know, so all those other techniques are not considered to be GMO, um, which is interesting because, you know, they are modifying the genes in these crops. They're just doing it in a different way than this more, you know, these more modern techniques, which are more precise, um, you know, so scientists can actually, you know, take genes, insert them and there are a lot less unintended consequences than, you know, when you're crossbreeding plants or using mutagenesis, there, you know, there, there are so many different mutations that happen when you, when you use those techniques. Um, they're so much more random. There's so many more unintended consequences. And so GMO is only referring to these more modern techniques, which are actually more precise, um, they're way more heavily regulated. So, um, so transgenesis is what GMO is referring to. And it takes something like $130 million and like seven years before a transgenic crop can be approved for the market because there's so many regulations and testing that needs to go on before it can be approved. And so it's just when you understand, um, you know, exactly what modification is and, and how all of these different techniques can, can be used. And the one that everyone is afraid of is really the most precise, you know, the most tested, the most regulated. Um, it just really doesn't make any sense that you would be more afraid of that than you would be afraid of, um, you know, all these other ways that we've been modifying crops in the past. And um, I guess the point isn't to be afraid of any of them. When I tell people that a lot of times they're like, oh, I'm afraid of mutagenesis now. And it's like, no, that's not the point. The point is that, um, you know, the safety needs to be assessed on the end product and not the process that was used to get there. So I think a lot of times people, you know, GMOs are a lot of different things. When, when somebody just, you know, makes a blank, blanket statement of like GMOs are bad, that just doesn't even make sense because GMOs are so many different things. They're not just one thing. Um, you know, there's, there's herbicide tolerant crops, there's drought tolerant crops, there's, um, you know, crops that essentially produce insecticide and so they can reduce insecticide usage and so there's so many different traits that can be selected for 
when creating these genetically modified crops. And so obviously all of them need to be assessed on the end product that is created. Um, and so it doesn't really matter, you know, what technique is being used to get there as long as the end product is safe, um, which they are. I mean, it's a, it's a global scientific consent, consensus that, um, you know, transgenic crops are just as safe and at least as nutritious, you know, as their non-transgenic counterparts. And so um, it's just one of those things that has been in the media so much. And it's one of those things too, where, you know, the people that understand the least about it are the most afraid of it. And so the more people learn about it, I think, you know, they're like, oh, this is not, this isn't what I really thought it was. And so you know, my point of my page isn't necessarily to defend these things or promote, you know, like I'm not making any money from telling people that GMOs are safe. I have no stake in, in it whatsoever. And so when people sort of accuse me of like being a shill or um, getting paid to promote GMOs, it just it, it's funny to me because I would get paid the same amount as if I didn't promote GMOs because I'm literally not getting paid for anything, <laughs> you know, to say anything on my page. And so, you know, my whole point is that at, at one point in my life, I was afraid of these things as well. And when I learned more about it, um, it helped me to not be afraid of food, not have so much anxiety around food. And so, um, you know, that's kind of my whole point is just educating people and whatever they decide to do with that information is fine. If they still, if they still want to buy products with a non-GMO stamp, like that's up to them. But um, I think it's good that, you know, they have the actual science-based information so that they can make decisions based on science rather than just these fear-based marketing labels that you see everywhere. And, so. and at least at the end of the day, you've done your job of trying to be as, as an educator and communicator Provide the facts, provide the science. I want to make sure you know what is true and what is not. And at the end of the day, it is your life, it's your, it's, it's your body, uh, it's your family. But obviously, you want to um, work a lot on, on the awareness and make sure they know what is the, the actual truth behind these, these, these names or these words that people are afraid of because most of the time it sounds different, it sounds weird, it sounds complex and because they don't understand about it, they are scared. They, uh, they fear mm -hmm. because they just don't know uh, but they won't do right. a research or they, don't, they, don't, yeah. they won't look, look it up and try to find out what, is, yeah. what it says. And I think too, I mean, obviously like, these non-GMO labels that are on so many different things now, they're not helping, you know, they're not helping to educate consumers. So when, when a consumer that doesn't really understand what GMO means, they see a label that says non-GMO, you know, most consumers are going to think, well, GMOs must be bad. Why would they have these labels that say specifically non-GMO? And so I think a lot of it has a lot of the fear specifically of GMOs has be, has come about since those labels have been on foods. Um, otherwise people probably wouldn't even, wouldn't even know what GM, you know, what genetically modified is or um, have a reason to be afraid of it. And so I think those, you know, that, that specific organization, if you go onto their website, they say that they're educating consumers, but they're really not. I mean, having that label on a package isn't telling the consumer anything helpful about what GMOs are or, um, you know, it's not telling you anything helpful about the food. And the other thing too that I wanted to mention about the non-GMO label is it's not a mandatory label. So that's, I think, another misconception that consumers think that everything that's non-GMO like has to have that label. And so they just assume that if food doesn't have that label, it must be a GMO, which isn't true. Um, that label is something that companies pay for, um, essentially to market their products if their product is non GMO. But, you know, I worked at a popcorn company, there is no GMO popcorn. And we paid for this non GMO label, even though there is no GMO popcorn. And so it can be put on products that don't even have a GMO counterpart. And so 
that's another misconception. There's only 10 GMO crops. And I think, I think people think that if it doesn't have a non-GMO label, it must be GMO, but um, that's not true either. And it doesn't really matter because as I said, even if, even if they were GMO, we wouldn't need to be afraid of them anyways. So.